Minister Rafiq Mansour, Deputy Chief of Mission for the U.S. Embassy here in Singapore. If you're a reader or a special guest or a writer, we can't thank you enough for spending this evening with us. And to our live streaming viewers joining us from wherever around the globe you are, a warm welcome. You're joining us here at The Pod. We are on the 16th floor of the National Library of Singapore. Here today for the launch of the book, America, A Singapore Perspective, edited by Professor Tommy Ko and Daljeet Singh. Now, some people say nowhere in the world is a city at greater crossroads of East and West than here in Singapore. And as such, the need to understand America is perhaps nowhere greater than right here. There have been dozens of books on America, where it's been, what it stands for, and what it could mean for future generations. The story of America is constantly being told and written, contested and rewritten. But really, there's only one book that we're launching today, really, that reflects on the many intractable issues that American thinkers have grappled with from a uniquely Singaporean perspective. Racism, political partisanship, the question of the continued dominance of the US dollar. Well, all this and more are covered by Professor Ko and Daljeet Singh and the many essayists in this book. I'm Michelle Martin from Money FM 89.3, and I'm so happy to be here on the happy occasion of the launch of a brilliant new book of essays. To get our proceedings going, I hope you will join me and welcome the CEO of the National Library Board of Singapore, Mr. Ng Chirpong. Shaji the first, Rafik Bansor. Ambassador at Large, Professor Tommy Cole. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here today for the official launch of the book, America, a Singapore Perspective, edited by Professor Tommy Cole and Mr. Daljit Singh. The, this book features 29 essays that aim to help Singaporeans better understand the complexities of American society and politics. The history of relations between Singapore and the United States goes back about two centuries. In 1836, Joseph Ballastier was appointed the first American consul to Singapore. Ballastier had an enormous sugar plantation here, and Ballastier Road runs along what used to be his estate. While the name of uh, Joseph Ballastier may not ring a bell with most Americans, uh, the name of his wife most certainly will. Maria River Ballastier was the daughter of Paul Revere, a hero of the American Revolution. In 1843, Maria Ballastia donated a Revere bell to St. Andrew's Church, now St. Andrew's Cathedral. This is said to be the only Revere bell outside the United States and is now on permanent display at the National Museum of Singapore. The Ballastias are just some of the many Americans who have arrived in Singapore over the last 200 years. Over time, relations have grown stronger, especially after, after the appointment of the first US ambassador to Singapore in 1966. Uh, this was taken to a new level following the signing of the US-Singapore Free Trade Agreement in 2003, where uh, Ambassador at Large, Professor Tommy Koh, was the chief negotiator. The ties between the National Library Board and American institutions are also strong. The US Embassy has very kindly donated books and audiovisual materials to our public libraries and to the Kids Read program. Uh, earlier this year, to mark 55 years of diplomatic ties, the NLB also worked with the US Embassy on a virtual photograph exhibition. We provided access to archival photographs and also curated a selection of ebooks about the relationship. Uh, in addition, NLB has strong ties with institutions such as the Library of Congress and Smithsonian Libraries. In August 2013, we hosted the Library of Congress's International Summit of the Book in Singapore. Uh, then in 2014, uh, we joined uh, the Biodiversity Heritage Library, which is an initiative mooted by the Smithsonian Libraries. Uh, the Biodiversity Heritage Library is a consortium of libraries uh, that cooperate to digitize uh, the legacy literature of biodiversity held in their collections and to make that literature available for public access. Given the strong bonds between NLB and the U various US institutions like the US Embassy, the Library of Congress, and Smithsonian Libraries, uh, it is fitting that this book about America from a Singapore perspective is being launched here in the National Library building today. Uh, I hope that the book will be widely read and enjoyed in the months and years to come. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Ng. If you've just joined us, welcome to the launch of America, A Singapore Perspective, a book that's been edited by Tommy Ko and Daljit Singh, a collection of essays to help Singaporeans understand America. Now, from granular detail to a broad sweep of analysis, the book covers 200 pages, uh, but it's an extensive sweep. So I'm hoping that we're going to hear now about what happened to pull it all together, but S. Murali's speech is top secret. He wouldn't give me any insight. A time to welcome the book's publisher, editor from the Straits Times Press, Mr. Morley, please. Thank you. Um, good afternoon to the guest of honor, uh, Deputy Chief of Mission for the U.S. Embassy, Mr. Rafik Mansour, uh, our distinguished editors of the book, Prof. Tommy Ko and Mr. Daljit Singh, Mr. Ng Pong, CEO of the NLB, honored guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, when I was asked to make a short speech this afternoon, I first wondered what on earth for. Uh, this should be a day, uh, and it is a day, for the authors and, and uh, the editors of the publication. But then I reconsidered, and since ST Press is a proud publisher of this pub excellent publication, I agreed to make a short uh, speech to mark the occasion, and trust me, it'll be short. Um, I would like to use the opportunity to do two quick things. First, to thank the two editors, Prof Ko and Mr. Daljit Singh, for conceptualizing and putting together this excellent collection of essays. Having received it two days ago, I discovered that it was compelling reading and found myself uh, enriched and educated and enlightened at the end of it all, uh, which surely must be the aim of any uh, tome that is released. Other than the two editors and the authors who contributed essays, I would also like to thank our excellent team at ST Press, uh, Editor Lee Hui Chair, Design Guru Lok Hong Liang, and the team of Irene, Sharon, Elsie, Sylvester and Vimala, who are here to help uh, promote the publication. Can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> My second reason for agreeing uh, to address all of you today is that it grants me an opportunity to talk about the old but new company I am now working for. You must all have read the news of the demerger of SPH and um, into a listed entity that is up for sale and a media entity called SPH Media Trust. Today marks day nine of operating under the new not-for-profit media trust and our new board and management. So a newspaper like the Straits Times, which is a 176 years old, is now finding new life and purpose under the Media Trust, one that aims to help us scale new journalistic heights and serve our audience better. Under this new iteration, we at ST Press are also keener to put our names besides publications such as this one, to add our voice and expertise to the conversations that must take place in a developed society. In conclusion, I'd like to congratulate everyone involved in the publication and promise on behalf of ST Press that we look forward to more such exciting endeavors in the future. Thank you. Might have been short, but you know, typical of a newspaper man, uh, large amount of words expressed in the least amount of words, large amount of thoughts in the least amount of words. Now, why at this moment of the U.S.'s history has our next speaker taken this endeavor to edit this series of carefully observed essays on America? And is this a book that every Singaporean should read? Let's find out. Please help me welcome the man who needs no introduction, Professor Tommy Koh. Our beautiful MC, Michelle Martin, uh, Mr. Ng Chia Pong, the CEO of National Library Board and our host for the book launch. My publisher, represented by Burali Subramaniam, Mr. Rafiq Mansour, my good friend, uh, ladies and gentlemen. In accordance with my wife's good advice, 
I will limit myself to making only three points. First, <clears throat> I want to explain why my good friend Daljit Singh and I decided to edit a book on America. Our friendship goes back to our high school. We were classmates in RI. That's how long we've known each other. We both think it is important for us non-Americans to understand America. Why? Because America is the world's only superpower. It has the world's largest economy, the largest military, and very significant cultural power. We do not agree with the view that America is in terminal decline <clears throat> and will soon be surpassed by a rising power. America is very important to Singapore, to the other countries of ASEAN, and to the Asia-Pacific region. America, however, is a complex country. Uh, not many people truly understand America, and our ambition in editing this book is to try to explain America. It is not the purpose of the book to defend America. That is Rafik's job, not, not, not ours. We are very proud of the fact that the 29 essays in the book were written by Singaporeans and Singapore-based writers. Um, and I must say, as the co-editor of the book, that we are very proud of the essays. They are very good essays. Um, one of my ambitions is to grow Singapore's intellectual capital. So this book is an example of our intellectual capital. <laughs> my other ambition is that Singapore will become known as a country which launches many books and not missiles. Um, my second point, I want to thank my friend Rafik for accepting our invitation to be our guest honour. Rafik is the Deputy Chief of Mission of the Embassy of the United States of America. <clears throat> he is a member of the Korea Foreign Service and prior to coming to Singapore, he has served with great ability as the Deputy Chief of Mission of the U.S. Embassy in Armenia. And as I explained to Rafiq, there are many historical connections between Armenia and Singapore. Until the 6th of December, we did not have an ambassador of the United States in Singapore. But during these past five years, the U.S. Embassy has continued to do very good work under the able leadership of um, the two deputy chiefs, Stephanie Siptak Ramna and more recently Rafik Mansour. There is a new U.S. Ambassador in Singapore, Ambassador Jonathan Kaplan. He presented his credential to the President last Monday and uh, I want on all our behalf to extend a warm welcome to Ambassador Kaplan and to wish him great success. My third point is to thank many, many people. We want to thank our publishers, Weeboon and Morale. We want to thank Irene Lee and her team for organizing the book launch. We want to thank our wonderful editor, Hui Che. Is Hui Che here? Hui Che is not here. She's, she's a really outstanding editor. We also want to thank the book's creative designer, Hong Lian. Hong Lian is also not here. Okay. We want to thank the 27 friends who accepted our invitation to write the essays for us. When I told Daujit um, earlier this year that I would like all the writers to be from Singapore, he said it, it's not possible. But um, as usual, my optimism has proven right. We want to thank Professor Chan Hing Chi, who's sitting in the bank, who served at 16 years as our ambassador to the United States for her excellent forward. Thank you, Hing Chi. We want to thank our MC, Michelle Martin, 
for helping us out this afternoon. She's a very distinguished journalist of both radio and television. She currently works for a radio station called Money FM. But for her service as MC, uh, Daljit and I have not paid her any money, but, but a lot of love. Yeah. And by the way, there's another radio station in Singapore called Love FM. We want to thank uh, Audrey Quake, who will moderate the panel discussion. Audrey, where are you sitting? Huh? Audrey, Audrey is the opinion editor of the Straits Times. And I try to write a monthly column for her. Um, finally, I want to thank our good friend Chia Pong for hosting this book launch. Chia Pong, uh, thank you for your wonderful speech. Huh? And as you may know, uh, there is a book on Dr. Balathea. Uh, I'm a lover of books and libraries. The National Library is therefore my favorite venue for launching my books. Uh, thank you, Chok Pong, for making this possible. Thank you all very much. I'd now like to call upon Mr. Rafik Mansour, Deputy Chief of Mission for the U.S. Embassy, Singapore. Please address us. Colleagues, friends, really what a treat to be here today with you to launch this important book. I have been an American diplomat for almost a quarter of a century, and Singapore is the 10th country where I have served over the past 23 years. And I've always learned a lot about the United States through the eyes, the perspectives, the insights of foreigners, friends, and colleagues. The 29 essays which comprise this book help me see the United States through the eyes of distinguished Singaporeans. I'm grateful for the opportunity to read the book and for the honor of launching the book with you this evening. Special thanks to Ambassador Professor Tommy Koh for the invitation tonight. Tommy. You have been a friend of the United States since you went there on a Fulbright scholarship. I am grateful for the fruitful exchanges we have had over the past two and a half years. You are the man who Prime Minister Go Chong Tong described in Standing Tall as Singapore's public conscience. What a beautiful description. It's really an honor to be here. There are a couple of themes that have come up repeatedly throughout the book. Immigration and the American dream. I think that Tommy was spot on when he wrote, what unites the people of the United States of America is not race. It is not a common religion. It's a set of values and ideals. I thought I would start by sharing a couple of personal anecdotes as America's ideals and the American dream are indeed dear to my heart. So I'm going to reveal a couple of personal stories with you here. The first one, I moved to the United States of America on July 17, 1990. Exactly two weeks later, on August 2nd, 1990, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. And that led to the first Persian Gulf War. It was not easy to be the only Arab kid in an American public, California public high school as a junior that year. I will tell you that I had a rough year. So it was my first year, I was 15, I was a junior. So not the easiest time to start with, but then add to that, that, that war and being, being an Arab kid in the school, it was not easy. A year later, so my senior year, my counselor, she came and she said, you know, 
I would like to nominate you for the Outstanding Youth Citizenship Award. She said, this is an award that's given to one high school graduate over the school district, so over seven high schools. So I thought that the lady was joking, but she did nominate me. And among the finalists were the mayor's daughter. And actually, if you had met the mayor's daughter, you would say she should win. Just such a magnificent young woman and such a wonderful citizen. I never thought I would win. And I did win. And for me, what was remarkable about it is the comeback of that kid who had a really rough year, his first year in America, and that just the second year he would be granted that honor. That has meant a lot to me, and in many ways, it was the beginning of my American dream. The second anecdote that I will share with you, those of you who have known me or who have worked with me, you realize that I am ill-qualified for the job that I do. At least academically, uh, I am not qualified because I did a degree in biology and a degree in French literature. Then I went to medical school. So not exactly how you would normally prepare to become a diplomat. So I moved to the US when I was 15. I became a US citizen when I was 21. And at the age of 23, I was selected as an American diplomat. Now, on one hand, our system is incredibly open and democratic. By that, I mean there are only two requirements to become a US diplomat. You need to be a US citizen, and you need to be between the ages of 21 and 60. But on the other hand, it's actually more selective than going to Harvard. Harvard, on average, accepts 7% of the applicant pool at the undergraduate level. The US State Department admits anywhere between 1% to 2% every year as foreign service officers. So I was in medical school, but for me, the great honor of being able to represent my country as a diplomat was impossible to resist. So I left medical school and you know, a quarter century later, 10 countries later, I have absolutely no regrets. But that's the America that I know and that's the America that, that I, I love. So why did Tommy Ko and Daljit Singh decide to produce this book? In their own words, the United States of America is the world's sole superpower. We do not agree with friends who hold the view that America is in terminal decline and will soon be overtaken by a rising power. They have underestimated America's strength, resilience, and political will. We believe that America will continue to be the leading power of the world. Well, I fully agree with Tommy and Daljit. In my own words, I would never want to bet against America. And even as Ms. Ariel Tan notes in her essay, the nation brought low in 2020 by COVID-19 also produced the world's two most effective vaccines for the virus. I thought some of the facts that Dr. Linda Lim outlined in her piece about the American economy and business were truly impressive. The United States has been the world's biggest economy in nominal terms for at least a century. In 2019, US GDP at over 21 trillion accounted for a quarter of the world's GDP. America is the world's largest host country for FDI. U.S. stock markets currently account for 60% of world stock market capitalization, and American companies accounted in 2021 for seven in 10 of the world's largest company by market cap uh, cap capitalization. Of course, no book as comprehensive about the United States as this one would not mention U.S. military might and hard power. As Dr. Joseph Liu mentions, my country has the largest defense budget and at $778 billion in 2020, the United States spends more on defense than the next 10 countries combined. I thought it was very wise to give the next chapter of the book to my friend Ko Bak Song to talk about US soft power. 
As a public diplomacy officer, I'm a firm believer in the value and impact of smart power. Kobak Song says, American soft power's overwhelming domination of the globe in living memory is beyond dispute. So why does American soft power still resonate most? Ko's answer is multifaceted. From American English becoming the world's preeminent language online, to Hollywood, to digital innovation, to US international business, to American networks, and finally, back to the power of the American dream. I would like to bring the conversation closer to home, to the region here, Southeast Asia and Singapore itself. Our friend Bilahari, in his piece, he notes, and I quote, the prosperity of East Asia is largely an American creation. No country, China included, could have succeeded without the stability that the US established. For the United States and Singapore, the depth and breadth of the connections that underpin our bilateral relationship are truly remarkable. Whether it be economic, security, or people-to-people -people ties, there are countless points where our countries connect. And despite the challenges of COVID-19, 2021 has seen some remarkable and historic moments which fully demonstrate this fact. One of the important highlights, of course, was the visit of Vice President Kamala Harris in August, when Singapore became the first Asian country visited by America's first woman, first Asian American, and first African American Vice President. The Vice President's travel was preceded by Secretary of Defense Austin in July and was followed recently by Secretary of Commerce Raimondo's visit. In addition, President Biden and Prime Minister Lee just held a bilateral meeting on the sidelines of the G20 in Italy. And I am delighted to announce that the US Ambassador Jonathan Kaplan arrived in Singapore this week and has already presented his credentials to the Singapore President. All of this to say that when Secretary Blinken promised that the United States would show up and consequentially engage in Southeast Asia, we're doing just that. But we have done more than just show up. We are working together on some of the most important issues facing the world today. So far, in 2021, we have launched the US-Singapore Partnership for Growth and Innovation. We announced the US-Singapore Climate Partnership, strengthened bilateral collaboration through our US-ASEAN Smart Cities Partnership, expanded our US-Singapore third country training program to include new courses on climate change and sustainability, deepened our cyber security cooperation with three new engagements, began working bilaterally and multilaterally to strengthen the world's supply chains, and also reaffirmed our deep commitment to upholding peace, stability, and security in Southeast Asia. The United States and Singapore are moving from strength to strength across a wide range of our bilateral partnership. We enjoy robust mill-to-mill -mill cooperation underpinned by the 1990 MOU, which, as you know, was renewed in September 2019 between President Trump and Prime Minister Lee until 2035. We also enjoy excellent non-military security cooperation, from cyber to counterterrorism to counterproliferation. We are also blessed with superb business investment and trade ties. The 5,400 U.S. companies based in Singapore have created more than 200,000 jobs in this country. U.S. companies are not only an engine for job creation, innovation, and creativity, they also put a premium on training and professional development, and they treat their employees right. I can't tell you how proud I am 
every year when the Straits Times releases its survey of the best employers in Singapore. And I see so many American companies, so many American employers in the lead. The United States is also, and actually by a large margin, the largest foreign direct investor in Singapore, 315 billion US dollars. That's larger than US FDI in China, South Korea, and India combined. I think that Vice President Harris put it best when she said, and I quote, I believe that when the history of the 21st century is written, much of it will be centered right here in the Indo-Pacific. And it was also in Singapore that the Vice President announced that the United States is offering to host APEC in 2023. You may recall what I said earlier that 2021 has seen some remarkable and historic moments for the US-Singapore relationship. One such moment is the 55th anniversary of our bilateral relationship. The United States and Singapore shared history has built a very strong foundation for a secure, prosperous, and innovative shared future. But these past 55 years of partnership are just the beginning. Through our defense and security agreements, our longest free trade agreement in Asia, and the deep ties between our people, the strong and enduring partnership between the United States and Singapore continues to flourish. To celebrate our partnership, we recently launched a new virtual photo exhibit entitled From Sea to Shining Sea, 55 Years of U.S.-Singapore Relations in Photos. If you haven't seen it yet, I encourage all of you to visit ussg55inphotos.com. ussg55inphotos.com to see how our relationship and human connections have evolved over the past 55 years. Colleagues, friends, distinguished guests, tonight is one I will remember. Once again, I am honored to be launching this important book with you. Thank you for this opportunity and the great honor that is representing my country in your beautiful home. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mansour. If you could head to the stage, the co-editors, Professor Ko and Daljit Singh, would like to present you with a copy of the book. Wonderful. And gentlemen, if we can put you to work a little more, could all three of you sign our book poster? This will represent the launch of the book. Oh, anywhere you'd like. And then we'll NFT it.
And we've officially launched the book. Round of applause, please. <laughs> Could you take this? Yeah, sure. Gentlemen, if you will take your seats, we're about to move to the panel discussion. Time for me to call on our moderator today, Audrey Quek. She's the Straits Times opinion editor. Over to you, Audrey. Hello. Okay. Um, uh, well, it's almost evening, but good afternoon. Uh, so, uh, thank you everybody to being here with us uh, for the book launch and also for this part of uh, the launch, which is the panel discussion. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank uh, Tommy and uh, Daujit for producing a really wonderful treasure trove of uh, essays put together. Um, when I was told that, um, you know, I was asked to moderate and I, I was given a soft copy of the book, I had to kind of stop work and say, I got to read this <laughs> because it was very fascinating. So, so um, you know, uh, okay, my impression was um, <clears throat> if you were going to write a primer for a proverbial Martian that just landed on Earth and said, what is this country called America? I thought it did a wonderful job because it's such a, a vast range of aspects from hard power, soft power. You, you even um, had, um, and warts and all, it's not a, a, you know, a sanitized look at the country. Um, and it resonates um, because you have, you know, like the chapters, for instance, like when I was reading about the Supreme Court hearing of the Roe versus Wade, I thought of Lydia and her essay on, you know, yeah. uh, what, what's the history behind it? And then all the controversies about gun, uh, gun laws and all that, I thought of Jeremy's essays. So, so it, it is a living book in the sense that it keeps on resonating. Um, the issues are old, but it has always a new uh, look you know, to each and every issue. So first, I'd like to ask Tommy and Daljit uh, to give us a sense of the making of this book, you know, like movies, you always ask the director, to, how you came up with the idea, how do you decide on all the various <coughs> chapters? Actually, um, the, the truth is that, as you know, I spent uh, over 20 years of my life staying in America, but I've studied America for even longer and it has always been one of my ambitions to understand America. Um, one of the books that I admire so much about America was written a very long time ago by a Frenchman, Alexis de Tocqueville, oh, Democracy yes, in America. It's a classic. And several members of the American community in Singapore have asked me to write a book on America. Yeah. Oh. And I said, I'm not clever enough to write a book on America, but I might consider editing a book on America. The book came about during one of our frequent lunches with Daljit. Uh -huh. I told Daljit that uh, let's, let's edit a book together. You know? <clears throat> and he said, on what? So I said, what about a book on America? You yeah. know? And then he said, uh, could I conceptualize the book and uh, suggest the table of content? I said, yes. Then he said, can he invite some of his American friends to write for me? I said, no. I want the book to be a book written by Singapore writers. I want this to be a book on America from a Singaporean viewpoint. Mm -hmm. you know? So it was a wild idea, but I managed to find many Singaporeans from some old friends, some young friends, some people I did not know, but who are friends of friends. And I must say that uh, I'm sure Daoji will agree with me that we are very proud of all the essays in the book. Yeah. They are very good, very good essays. And yes. I'm really proud of it. And I'm, I'm pleased that Rafik approves of the book. No, we, we didn't try to sanitize the book, no. I mean, we, we, we want to tell the story faithfully, accurately, sympathetically, but also critically. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about American core values and ideals. I also talk about the gap between ideal and reality. Yes. You know? 
my essay with the African American was fairly critical, I think, yes. you know? Yeah. Yes. So, so it, it's an honest book. I mean, we, I think I'll let Daljit continue with this story. Daljit, you, you want to say anything more? You, you, Use the mic. Well, you have said everything, Toby. I mean, you, you suggested Ask, the book, I, I, and I heartily agree. You were supposed to defend America, <laughs> according to Tommy, in the introduction. No, no, the purpose of the book is yes, to explain yes, America, yes, I know, not to defend America. Yes, but... Um, Rafiq's huh. job is to defend America. So if you've got questions critical about America, ask Rafiq. Okay, yes, I shall, I shall. <laughs> yes. But yeah. if you've got praise for the book, ask me. Okay, sure, absolutely. Uh, but Dojit, um what stood out for you in the making of this book? What was the highlight? What is, what was I mean, you edited so many chapters. What was the highlight for you? You know, what was the biggest takeaway in, you know, oh, working yeah. on this book? What? Oh, I think there was no single. There was no single highlight. You know, I, there were quite a number of very good chapters. Yes. You know, and there was no poor chapter. Yeah. <laughs> right. All were very interesting and useful. Right. And uh, we made sure that we had not just the standard sort of chapters of the country. Mm -hmm. You have to have certain chapters, no? like yeah. the economy, uh, defense, uh, the role of the dollar, foreign policy, and so on. Yeah, those are standard chapters. Mm -hmm. But we also made sure that we reflected some of the issues yes. um, in American society and culture Right. which are receiving a lot of publicity in the media worldwide, right. but are not properly understood. Yes. You know, for example, guns. Yes. You know, why, why is there so much gun violence? And why do the crazy Americans <laughs> love guns? Yeah, yeah? I, thought, I thought Jeremy's a lot of people don't understand gun that. was very good. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes, yes yeah. that's true. Yes, yeah. Yes. We, and we things see. like that. Right. Christian nationalism. Right. And that, that's yes. not very well... Yes, well, uh, not publicize, no. yeah. but it's very important. That's a very good essay yes, too, you know? Yeah, yeah that essay. was very fascinating yeah, to and, me. And an essay on the white poor yes. was also a very good essay. So every essay is a good essay. Yes. I, I learned so much editing the book. <laughs> oh, yeah, really? Yeah. Even for someone who spent so much of my life in America. Uh -huh. And I'm sure Heng Chi did the same. Huh? So Tommy, um, you, you mentioned uh, these lesser known aspects of uh, America. So, what was? Um, could you give us an idea? Of what was most revealing, new to you? You know, I mean, yes. I mean, I learned a lot from the essay. I, um, I, I learned much more about the U.S. economy and uh -huh. its inherent strength from Linda Lim's essay. Oh yes. Yeah? Yeah. I I was very puzzled about. The, the strength of the US dollar over such a long period of time. So I asked my good friend Vikram Khanna whether he could write an essay on the mighty dollar. And I think he did a very good essay, yes. you know, and say that the reign of the mighty dollar may not, may, it's not forever, you know. Right. At some point it may be taken over by other currencies, but for the time being it remained the world's reserve currency. Um, I wanted to know more about the abortion wars. Oh, yeah. And I thought Lydia did a very good job with that. I've, I've always been very puzzled by America's love for guns. And I asked Jeremy, who was served in Washington, whether he could explain America's love for guns. Do, do you know that there are more guns than people in America? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's true. In the Netherlands, there are more bicycles than people, but in America, there are more guns than people. But unless you read Jeremy's essay, you wouldn't understand you know, why it's, it's rooted in history, it's in a constitution, it's the way of life of American people in the, in the Midwest, in the, in the mountain states, you know. So, so these are all things that are very puzzling to Singapore. Mm, yeah. Or even the rise of President Trump is a huge shock to the world, you know. Yes. So I asked Namal Gosh to explain the Trump phenomenon and I thought he, he did a good essay too, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I learned a lot from the book. That, thanks, Tommy. It's, it's, it's really fascinating for me, too. I mean, I know some of them are my colleagues, and uh, I've, I've read them. But it's sort of 
pull them all together. So um, for me, um, one takeaway was a, a recurrence of a certain themes throughout the chapters, which was change. Right. It's, uh, it started off with Prof Chan's um, forward, where she mentioned that someone told her in 2012 that this is no longer your grandfather's Republicans. Right. And, uh, and, and her, her point was, how, it's not your grandfather's Democrats either. Right. So um, that was 2012, and lots of things have changed. Right. And what got me for some chapters down was um, a comments made by Bill Hari in his piece about, um, well, what seems like America, the bipolar country, it goes through waves of you know, supreme self-confidence, and then it goes through troughs of self-doubt, right? And he made a very legitimate point, which is, but don't take this for permanent, right? It may be down, you know, if you feel down, but it's not a permanent state of affairs. Um, I'd like to put uh, this, this whole notion of change to Mr. Wansou about this um, America in a flux. Now, um, of course, it's tried to say that every society undergoes change. You know, that's the whole idea of dynamism. But uh, of, uh, I guess since 2016, after the shock of Trump, and then most recently with the um, raid on Capitol building, a lot of people are saying that, um, are questioning if America is uh, going through a, a phase of change that is more dramatic and long-term, more significant than the humdrum change that you see from year to year. And the, you know, for friends, America is not just you know um, people who don't see eye to eye. There is a certain amount of concern internally as well. Like, uh, will this change mean that the friend we used to know uh, would no longer be the same person that we've known for the longest time? Are we to worry about that? Um, to you know, I mean. Like, for instance, it's re reflected in the Atlantic. They have a special edition called Democracy in Crisis. Could you tell us, give us your thoughts about, you know, this change that's undergoing in America and what are America's friend to make of it? Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, as I mentioned earlier, I, I really learned a lot from the way that foreigners look at my country. And it helps me be more reflective and more analytical in my own views of, of the United States. I think it's important, first of all, to remember that the United States, it's almost 350 million people. Um, and that it's a culture that truly values diversity, including diversity of opinion. So uh, critical thinking is part of what every American kid is, is taught. And uh, we are probably more individualistic and uh, having some unique skills and going in the direction that you want to go is probably also at the essence of some of our innovation and creativity. In other words, Americans are not taught to all think alike. The other thing that I would note is, and definitely our country is richer for that, I believe. The other thing I would note is that many foreigners, when they travel to the United States, they stick with the coasts, you know, East Coast, West Coast. I think it's important to remember that there is a big country in between. What, what is often referred to as the flyover states. And I think that that group felt forgotten. And um, that, I think, was important in the United States over the past few years. Now, you mentioned the events on January 6th. Yes. Uh, and of course, these pictures were, were shocking, were shocking to the world, were shocking to most Americans, and were shocking to people who believe in America and its ideals. And I think that that day reminded us of how fragile a democracy is. And it doesn't matter how well established it is. Uh, like we think that we have a well established democracy, but it's definitely not perfect. And I think it reminded us as Americans that, that 
it's always hard work and it's always continuous work to strive for that more perfect union mm -hmm. that Americans have always been searching for and that our work is clearly not done. If you'd allow me, I would like to quote my Secretary of State, Secretary Blinken. Our, about, this is about January 6th. Our democracy is, is resilient. After January 6th, members of Congress came back to the buildings that had been under siege. They stood up for the Constitution. They stood up for the institution. And even as we are grappling with this ongoing problem, we are doing it in a way that is transparent. That is out there for the entire world to see. And I think that's also one of the reasons it's so easy to criticize the United States because we are transparent. We don't try to hide things. Unlike in some other places, we are not trying to sweep it under the rug and we're not trying to ignore it. We are not trying to deny it. We are confronting it and sometimes it's ugly. Sometimes it's painful, but it's also incredibly powerful. Thank you. Um, but you, you mustn't, um, sorry, you mustn't, um, you mustn't um, underemphasize the foreigners' concern about your country. I mean, many of us have served in your country, Barry Dasker, King Yong, uh, Bilhari Hengji, myself. Um, the, the America of today is not the America we knew. You know, so America has not always been so divided, so polarized as it is today. In my years in Washington, one of the things I admired very much about America was the, um, the political culture. After after an election, the candidate who loses the election would be gracious. He would phone the winner, you know, and congratulate him. He would accept the outcome. This is not true today. Um, in the U.S. Senate, uh, in the times I served in Washington, the leaders of the two parties may be competitors, but they were friends and colleagues, you know. They, they, they have dinner together, they go out together, they were able to, to put country before party and party before self. When I look at America today, I am concerned, to some extent even dismayed, that we have American leaders who put self before party and party before country, you know? The, the relationship between your two principal parties today is toxic, you know? They see each other as not, com not as competitive, but as enemies. So this is, this is an America that, that is worrisome, no? So you mustn't whitewash this, no? No, I think you're right, Tommy. Uh, you know, recently we had the visit of uh, Secretary of Commerce, uh, Raimondo, and uh, she met with Prime Minister Lee, and um, what a great statesman you have in your Prime Minister, if you would allow me to say that. Um, and she brought up the infrastructure bill that had just passed. Uh, I wouldn't say it was, you know, 500 to zero, but there was a bipartisan element to it. And I think that this is encouraging because part of the problems that our country is facing right now is because of inequity. And I think that bills like the infrastructure bill or the social bill or the build back better bill, as they address some of the basic needs of people, uh, including, you know, technology, including um, healthcare, including childcare, which I think is also a big issue in the United States. Uh, as people's basic needs are met and the inequities are at rest, I think that that will help address some of the divisions that you're talking about. Um, is, uh, following up on, sorry, you would like to say something, don't you? Well, um, there has been a lot of change Yes. Uh, your question was about change. Right, right? yes. And um, I'm worried about the polarization, the political polarization in American society. 
I, I still believe that America will remain the leading power uh, in many mm -hmm. respects. Some have been mentioned here before. But the political polarization does worry me yes. uh, because if there is a, a lot of internal strife, um, the isolationist sentiments will strengthen and America could withdraw from the world. So that does worry me. But I, I also think there's, I, I mean, it's difficult to predict. America may well be able to overcome this. Yes. Uh, I can quote from Gretchen Liu's first chapter. Yes. Huh? Yes. If there is one thing that history has shown, it is that Americans are remarkably resilient. Right. Past challenges have been faced with endurance, ingenuity, optimism, openness, and creativity. No doubt future ones will be as well. I hope that turns out uh, to be correct, but right. there are some dangers. Yes, I, I, I agree with your reading of it. There is this element of resilience. I think, um, as uh, Mr. Maso put it, um, the fact that America is so open, we see it all and we worry, right? Unlike closed society, societies where you don't see the flaws until everything kind of bursts out in the open. But um, it is um, kind of um, concerning that you have, you know, Paul's Pew and, you know, uh, Harvard um, also had a recent poll about uh, Americans being worried themselves, right, about the state of democracy. And this brings, out to, brings on to this other question, um, the summit of democracies that starts later on, a few hours from now. Um, could I uh, find out, you know, there's been a lot of chatter about what is this summit about, you know, is it, um, you know, what, what does, it, what does uh, President Biden hope to achieve? And in fact, is it counterproductive? So could you give us a sense in Singapore of why, what's the mission, uh, what's the goal of the summit? And how do you answer some of the questions involved? Rafik, in it, it's, it's not in the book, you know, so if you don't want to answer, you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but I think... <laughs> you know, I was curious, why, 20, why 29 essays? Why not 30? <laughs> maybe this would have been the 30th. Uh, uh, maybe this, this could be my next book. Yes. Is Singapore a democracy? <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, I, I think that the... I mean, I think that 2020 was such a uh, tumultuous year. It was such an eventful year for the world. Uh, of course, COVID, but... Also, you know, I think that our 2020 election has captivated the world uh, for the better and for the worse, right? And I wouldn't say that uh, it was all bad. For instance, the level of civic participation in the 2020 election in the United States was remarkable. Uh, believe it or not, because I read the book, I know that President Trump won 11 million votes more in 2020 than he did in 2016. Yes. And he lost the election. So I think that as, as a um, humble nation that can do some self-reflection and self-criticism, we realize just how important uh, that topic is for the world. And that, uh, you know, projecting democracy globally also starts at, at home. And we wanted to get together with some nations, not to point blame, but to share experiences, because democracy is tough and hard work. Um, and President Biden, he believes that the challenge of our time is to demonstrate that democracies can actually deliver, and that by improving the lives of the people, uh, that's what you really need to do. And so you see it also in many of the bills that he has been trying to do and also in his approach to many things, including trade. And that is the importance that it improves the life of the average American. I'll, I'll share a little anecdote with you. 
When, when President uh, Biden was elected, one of the things that he has done, actually the first place that he visited in Washington, D.C., as far as the U.S. government agency is concerned, is the State Department. So it was a great honor for all of us at the State Department that the first trip by our president was to our department. And he said that he is committed to putting diplomacy back at the heart of American foreign policy. Soon after that, uh, I was the charge d'affaires here at the time, and all U.S. chiefs of mission in Asia got a call from Secretary Blinken. And the Secretary was talking to us about why this region is special and why it's important for our interests. And one of my colleagues I thought was quite audacious on the first call with the Secretary of State, it probably that person would have been fired in most other countries. He said, you know, Mr. Secretary, all what you're saying is fantastic and every new administration is wonderful and attractive at the beginning. But how do we know that in four years from now or in eight years from now, the trend will not be reversed? Which I think is a question that's on many people's minds, Americans and foreigners alike. And Secretary Blinken said, we need to do a better job tying foreign policy to the life of the average American every day. And I think that this is something that the administration is keen on. Mm -hmm. How do we use uh, foreign policy as what, one of our instruments of power to advance the lives of ordinary Americans? And this is something that's important for this administration. I, I, I think you have not answered her question. No. <laughs> Why did President Biden not invite Singapore to, to the <laughs> Summit <laughs> of Democracy? That's her question. Oh, was hey. that your question? Yes. That's uh, question. He read my mind. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, actually, our Assistant Secretary of State, uh, Dan Krutenbrink, was here last week. And the government of Singapore did not ask him this question. But the press did. The press did. And the answer is very simple. Uh, there are a limited number of countries, and it does not reflect on the depth and the breadth of the relationship and the partnership that we have with Singapore. We have a lot to learn from Singapore. That's, that's a non-answer. <laughs> I mean, come on, let's be truthful, no? The, the truth is that, and, and I think Hengji Bilhari will confirm this, the Democratic, the Democratic Party had never accepted Singapore as a democracy. When President Clinton hosted this equivalent summit, he also didn't invite Singapore to the summit. So, Bilhari, you put up your hand. Bilhari, can somebody give the somebody give the microphone to Bilhari, please? <laughs> oh, okay. Bilhari said he did us a big favor by not inviting us. <laughs> I, I, I think that's not my answer. I think my, I, I think this. I want to make a serious point, which is that that there's no single model of a democracy in the world. Huh? Yes. You have the Westminster form, the French form, the German form, the American form. There's no unitary model of what the democracy is. To me, I'm, I'm sorry to give you a lecture, to me, a country is a democracy if it guarantees to the people the right to vote. You have universal suffrage. Free and fair elections are held at regular intervals to elect a government. The Constitution protects the fundamental freedoms and rights of the individual. You have an independent judiciary. You have the rule of law. If all these criteria are satisfied, I would say the country is the democracy. Yes. And if you, I ask myself, does Singapore satisfy these criteria? I think the answer is yes. yes. But the Singapore model has many unique Singapore characteristics. So maybe to the eyes of the Democratic Party, these unique Singapore characteristics make Singapore not a true democracy. You know? So, but... But, I mean, I don't want to press Rafiq because I think he's not in a position to answer the question. I mean, it'll be... In, uh, it'll be interesting. <laughs> okay, okay. I mean, it'll be interesting. <laughs> okay. So, 
<laughs> so, so, so Bilal's yes. reaction is that he's very happy we're not invited. Yes. My yes. reaction is different. Different. That, yeah. that we should have been invited because we satisfy the fundamental criteria of what a democracy is. Yeah, so, so, so I accept, accept that, that. Okay, Heng Chi, put up a hand, maybe. Give somebody, give Prof Chan a, a, a microphone. Uh, Tom, you have all your criteria, that's fine. It's political. And I think Singapore dared to say the summit of democracy is not a good idea. I believe Prime Minister has said that. I've said that many times. Other people have said it. The United States should not hold a summit of, the de of democracy because it divides the world. And I don't think they want us to go and say this at the summit of democracy. <laughs> you know, I know that uh, in, I was in Washington when the community of democracies was launched. And uh, they were so concerned we would go and preach Asian democracy. You know, because we were known to be quite vocal on this. And uh, I don't know, Rafiq, I think the countries were selected by assistant secretaries of state. The regional heads will pick. And sometimes they choose allies. You know, I look at some countries, I raise my eyebrows. Why are they there? You know, so, well, I think I better stop. <laughs> and then what happened to the community of no. democracy? No, but you know, this is where we must understand America. If you read my essay on American core values and ideals, you will understand that American, many Americans feel that it's almost their divine mission to propagate democracy in the world. You know? yeah. So they, they feel that it's their mission to protect individual liberty, to promote democracy, to protect human rights. And of the two parties, you know, nobody can have a foreign policy based exclusively on values. You must have values and interests. The Democrats emphasize more on democracy and human rights. The Republicans emphasize interests. But, but it's a matter of degree, not of kind, you know. All Americans are committed to this core set of values and ideals. And democracy and human rights are among them. And very precious to Americans. Thank you. Thank Can you. I yes. just summarize what you just said, Tommy, which I don't agree, I, I don't disagree with in a simpler way. Americans, bless their souls, <laughs> go through these fits per periodically. And those of us who know them still love them despite these fits. <laughs> okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much for this very, very lovely. Yes. Okay. Well, actually, time is running out. Five minutes. So, um, I'm going to change, shift the focus a bit. It's still on the theme of change. Um, I, I look at the polls, right? Uh, ISIS every year uh, comes out with a kind of temperature checking, a checking of the region and how they view uh, the US, and it, you know, and. The, the, the most recent one, which was done last year and up to January, show um, America, you know, um, the likability ratings went up. You know, there was a lot of positive feeling compared to the previous years. And most recently, Lowy Institute came out with their Asia Power Index, and it showed a similar shift. You know, it, uh, America went up, China went down, right? So, um, so in, in this... Uh, this whole state of flux, things go up and down. So um, I'd like to uh, first um, address it to uh, Mr. Manso. Um, how do you, uh, given this positive reading, how do you see uh, America keep up this momentum? You know, to, the, there is um, hope in the sense that you know all is not lost, is, despite all the doom and gloom that's been talked. Talk, uh, that we've talked about. Um, how do you see America uh, maintain this uh, momentum? And I, I like Tommy's views and Adelgit's views too, that you know um, things are not like this downward trajectory. It, it, things do change. And what are your hopes? Since we're going into a new year, what, what are your feelings about 
US and um, Singapore relations, for instance, or relations with the region. No, I, I think that I think that objectively speaking, uh, and I will try to say this in in the most humble way possible. Um, America has a lot going for it, and when you think about it, it is still the dream destination, for instance, for foreign students uh, at the university level. So we still have about one million foreign students who study in American universities. And depending on which survey you look at, maybe you know, 15 out of the top 20 universities in the world are American universities. And I'm proud of the fact that the number one nationality studying in our foreign nationality studying in our universities are Chinese. There are over 300,000 Chinese studying in American universities. That gives me hope. The second is Indians, over 200,000. The third are Koreans. So, as you see, this region is very well represented. I am from California. If California were an independent country, it would be the sixth largest economy in the world. So think about just what California has to offer. Silicon Valley, innovation, creativity, Hollywood, the ocean. America has a lot to offer the world. So how can America maintain that momentum? Because I would not want Professor Tomiko to accuse me again of not answering your question, so I'm trying. <laughs> um, I think America ought to focus on its values and its strengths and what it has to offer the world. America has to be itself. Uh, America has to show the world that it's open to the world. And I think that we have seen many manifestations of that over the past few months. So I am quite optimistic about the future of the United States. I agree with our editors uh, that America is not a power in decline, far from it. But I think it's also important for America uh, to be humble. I think that President Biden is right in focusing on our partners, our allies, and our friends. Because also if COVID has shown us anything is that no one country can do it alone. I think that this region is really the future in so many ways. When we talk about public-private partnerships, for instance, this is a perfect example of this, you know, 50, 400 American companies. And I would like to maybe compliment Singapore on something that comes with, with companies. When I got this assignment and I learned that there are so many American companies here, I thought I would be spending most of my time here on commercial advocacy cases. Far from it. Uh, American companies feel that they are so fairly treated here, that they have the right access that they need with the Singapore government. And, and this is remarkable. I think that you are an incredible host, uh, not only for our companies, but for our citizens, and we're grateful for that. Thank you. Uh, Tommy, would you like to? Focus. What are your wishes for next year? Yes. It's too, too, too short a time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have any okay. specific So why don't I get to tell okay. you what my three wishes yes, yes. for America are next year. Right. Um, first, I, I wish America success in, uh, in building a strong, prosperous, and inclusive economy. And if America succeeds in doing this, it will become self-confident, it will this card is isolationist, protectionist instincts, and again be a champion of free trade and globalization in the world. And that America may in time come to reconsider its participation in CPTPP. So that's my first wish. My second wish is that while America will compete with China, 
which is perfectly understandable and natural. I hope America will not demonize China and will not go to war with China intentionally or accidentally over some hot issue like Taiwan. My third wish is that America will again be forward-leaning, will engage with the various regions of the world, including ASEAN, that, uh, that America will take ASEAN seriously, that President Biden will resume the practice of his predecessor, Barack Obama, in holding an annual summit with ASEAN leaders, that we will work together both in building the old economy, the new economy, and uh, that we will make U.S.-ASEAN relationship uh, a, very, a very good relationship. Those are my three wishes for next year. Thank you, Tommy. Yeah, I, I love all your points. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Can, can I say a word about democracy? I wanted to. Huh? Yes. I think, as Tommy said, there are different kinds of democracies. Right. Huh? Yeah. We are, in Singapore, we have one kind. I think we have never pretended to be a liberal democracy like the United States. I think most of the countries invited to the democracy summit are, are liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. There are a few exceptions. There are no. few. Not, not true, not, not true. Not <laughs> <laughs> no. A anyway, you, you, uh, you I, I thought you in, in Southeast stuff. Asia, the ones invited are liberal democracies. No, uh, Malaysia is more democratic no, than us, no, I think. Malaysia. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I, well, I see it uh, in global terms, uh, more a propaganda battle between the US and China. And uh, yeah, maybe it's OK, thank you. OK, so um, well. It's, it's, uh, it's time is much too short, and I really, really love to thank you know our panelists uh, for this very exciting, unexpected exchange, including members of the audience. Thank you so much uh, for being with us today. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, thank you very much, Audrey Quek, Straits Times Opinion Editor. Thank you to all our wonderful panelists and and hearty disagreement from the audience as well. We're not done yet. Um, to, to speak to us on the question of, is Singapore a democracy? No, I'm just kidding, Daljit. Let's hear some more comments from Daljit Singh. He's Senior Fellow with the ISIS Use of Ishak Institute. Thank you. To thank everyone once again, First of all, Professor Tommy Koh himself, whose idea it was to produce this book and who invited me to edit it with him. And many thanks also to Professor Chan Heng Chi, who gave her early support to the project and has written an excellent forward to the book. Thank you, Heng Chi, for being present here today. Then, of, then of course, I thank the various uh, uh, chapter writers Obviously, without them, there would be no book. And um, not all are here, but anyway, a hearty thanks. Huh? Next, our meticulous, untiring, and indispensable editor from Straits Times Press, Li Hui Chi. She's not here too, I think, huh? yes. Uh, who shepherded the book to publication stage. And uh, also, Mr. Morali, supervising editor of STP, as well as Irene Lee, Sharon, Michelle Martin, and others from the publishing side who have helped to organize this event today. A big thanks to Audrey, Audrey Quick, who was, who so ably moderated the panel discussion just now. And of course, Ang Chopin, CEO of National Library Board, for making available these very nice premises in a very central location in town. And being personally present uh, for, the, for the launch. But uh, last but far from the least, I thank DCM, 
Rafik <laughs> Mansour for being our guest of honor and for participating in the panel discussion. Thank you, Rafik. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Daljit Singh. Well, it's an indispensable guide to the United States of America and a very entertaining read as well. So thank you to all the contributors in the room, our VIP guests, and to you, our friends at home, for being with us all this time. The book to pick up is America, A Singapore Perspective. I'm Michelle Martin from Money FM 89.3. Until next time, happy reading. <laughs>